This special two-part series recorded with Jim Gore of the Global Wine Academy is designed to make you a better blind taster under exam conditions at both the WSET Diploma and Master of Wine levels. The first episode looking at the science behind blind tasting and why it may be so difficult before testing this out with a practical tasting of two still red wines. The second episode featuring a special focus on the category of fortified wines and how those techniques might need to be changed in that setting. Both episodes featuring tips on maximizing your score when blind tasting under exam conditions. Today's episode of the Blind Tasting Series with Jim Gore is a special on fortified wines. Building on the first episode of this series, which looked at the science of tasting, Jim focuses on assessing quality in fortified wines, before guiding us through a practical assessment of an Oloroso and a cream sherry. I'll then come in with some clarifying questions before Jim discusses some practical tips if you're interested in taking your tasting practice further. Enjoy! So today we're going to be having a look at understanding quality in wine um, with reference to fortified wines because that's one of the, um, the styles of wine that students often find quite difficult to work out the inherent quality Sometimes because they are massive fans of the category and sometimes because they're not, they find it difficult to to pull it apart. So when we're assessing a wine, what we're attempting to do is to be objective and to look um, to these sort of universal markers of quality. So what we'd often use is the standard BLIC um, ac- acronym, which you might be familiar with, um, with WSET and um, Master of Wine. So that's balance, length, intensity, which you've actually expanded to identifiable characteristics, and also complexity. And one thing that a lot of students don't really realise is that it can also be potential complexity so that you can't really mark a wine down just for being young. You have to look at the potential complexity of it. So this normally does a job for most wines, but what what um, we struggle with, and also many students st- struggle with as well, is what happens when you have a style of wine that's potentially either unusual or extreme, you know, such as orange wine or natural wine or fortified wines that we're going to talk about. So... Um, so we do have to go a little bit beyond Blick and to actually understand um, the wine itself and what the wine is attempting to do. So looking at the, what we might call the extreme elements of fortified wines, what pulls them apart from other wines. The one is the alcohol. So the alcohol has to be above uh, 15, 15.5%. So when you're trying to work out quality with fortified wine I find it really useful to actually discuss the balance of that alcohol even though the alcohol might be 20% how does it actually feel within the wine is it burning is it harsh Um, and we kind of look at how well that wine is doing at holding that that alcohol we've also got some quite unusual flavors biological aged flavors and oxidative um, aging flavors Um, So when we're looking at biologically aged wines, so we're looking at wines that are aged under under floor, um, such as um, such as sherry, such as fino sherry. Um, These aromas you don't normally find or you shouldn't expect to find in other wines. And if you did find them in another wine, you might think that's a little bit odd. It could even be faulty, perhaps. And particularly with deliberately oxidized fortified wines if you got even a whiff of the caramel the toffee and let's say a white burgundy we'd be saying this is oxidized so actually it's faulty so you can't always pull them side by side when you're looking at uh, flavors when you're looking at quality which is why you really have to think about the category or the style of wine that you're assessing and then add in blick on top of that 
So one thing to to note as well when you're looking at biologically aged aromas, um, the yeast character, any of the characters you get from floor, um, is you really have to look at the definition of those aromas. By um, by their nature, they're usually quite strong, um, but actually your top quality, let's say Fino Sherry's, would always have much more definition. Um, so that's something I'd focus on a little bit more in the Blick rather than just the inherent power of them. So um, the main question, can you compare the qualities of fortified wines with still wines? And the answer is broadly yes, um, but as I've alluded to um, earlier, what makes an outstanding Fino Sherry is quite different from what makes an outstanding Sauvignon Blanc. Now, being both outstanding, you'd expect that they'd have to hit as high as they could on balance, length, intensity, complexity. But if a Sauvignon Blanc was to have as low acidity as a Fino Sherry, we absolutely would be considering that it could be faulty. Whereas with Sherry, we actually accept that it's part of the character. So in a sense, you have to have an impression as to what the wine is trying to do, what the style of it is, what it's trying to achieve, and what are our expectations of a good, a very good and outstanding version of that wine. Um, To make it a little bit more clear, if we bring it back to um, a sort of standard still wine, what we look for in an outstanding Pinot Noir is not the same thing as an outstanding Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, maybe to make it even more simple for those of you who've done any WSET um, spirits qualifications when you're comparing a vodka versus a whiskey they are incredibly clear about what an outstanding vodka is you know there's almost the absence of flavor and aroma whereas with whiskey it's the opposite Um, So they can be both judged as being outstanding, or at least at the top end of the quality categories. But we can do that because we judge them on different criteria. Um, So still using Blick for the vast majority of it, but just to have somebody on your shoulder letting you know what makes an outstanding version of this wine um, or this great variety. So one thing that you do have to um, really think about is if you're guessing what the great variety is and you guess it incorrectly, sometimes that can push you down the wrong angle of, um, of quality. Is the wine lacking in aroma or is it just a delicate aroma? Um, and again, there is an element of look and skill in order to be able to work, work the difference out. Um, Another point as well is when you're looking at the category of fortified wines, you've got to understand that most of them don't improve in bottle. Um, So in a sense, you can't really hold that against the entire category. Um, If we were looking at Red Bordeaux, for example, top quality Red Bordeaux do age in bottle. So you could use a an ability to, to age as a positive or maybe a lack as a negative. But when you're looking at fortified wines, other than vintage port, really, they don't do that. So you can't hold that against them. Okay, so we're going to compare two different fortified wines now. Um, So we've got a Sanchez Romante Oloroso Sherry from the Wine Society. And we've also got Croft Original Pale Cream Sherry, which you can get at many places, but we got this one from Waitrose. So... Two very different wines, both within the, um, within the sherry category. Um, so let's have a little look at our uh, pale cream to start with. So having a little sniff, we're getting some light biologically aged notes, a little bit of bread, a little bit of yeast. Um, and there is some strength there, medium intensity when we're looking on the nose. But one thing that you'll note is that the aromas themselves are a little bit diffuse. They're not particularly um, precise. So that would be something that when I'm writing a note, I would just put next to it, that maybe it's a little bit more generic, not particularly um, precise. Um, We pick about Oloroso. 
the first thing to notice is that it's a lot stronger. So we're quite clearly in the pronounced category here. Um, and when we're looking at our oxidative notes, um, toffee, caramel, walnut, smells a little bit like sticky toffee pudding to a point. But even though we're getting more inherent complexity, we're getting more aromas on the nose. What's really different about this wine is that it's a lot more precise. So we can actually smell um, the aromas um, more strongly. So going on to the palate, um, I think what we're actually going to do, let's stick with the Oloroso on the palate um, and have a taste. And what's really interesting about this wine is that although it doesn't have any sugar in it, because there's so much caramel, because there's so much toffee flavour, um, the alcohol's about 20%. For some students, they may actually think there's a little bit of sweetness to it. So some people may actually call this wine off-dry rather than dry. But the way to really detect it is once you spat the wine out, if you just focus on your tongue on that finish, you'll see that there's no sugar that's sat there. But there's usually a little bit of leeway there because there is some form of impression of sweetness, even though there's no sugar there. Um, so alcohol for this is 20%. It's an incredibly old Oloroso. So the alcohol is really built up within the, um, or concentrated within the, the Solera system. Um, so this is what we call a full body style of fortified wine. Um, in terms of the acidity, um, it's actually more towards the lower end of acidity. But there's quite a distinct sharpness that you actually get um, with this wine on the, um, on the palate. So some people might be tricked into thinking that that's actually acidity. But quite frankly, 20% alcohol, um, you know, that's going to make your mouth water anyway. So that's one of the things you've got to think about with fortified wine is you have to get used to tasting this level of alcohol and kind of disregard it. Otherwise, you end up calling the wines a lot higher in acidity than they actually are. Now, the flavours are really strong, pronounced and a long evolving finish. Um, so when we're looking at the blick here, um, we're actually ticking a lot of these a lot of these categories. Um, so if we just roll through a quality assessment for this, um, at the start, I always think it's good to say what quality you think it is. So I'm saying this is an outstanding wine. And then what we then do is then we then comment on all the different elements that, that's made the wine outstanding as a justification. So no bullet points here. It has to be full sentences. So I've, I've put here there's an outstanding balance between the high alcohol and flavor intensity. And the wine therefore seems warming rather than harsh. So actually justifying what that balance does for the, um, the quality. Um, a set of clear and precise oxidized aromas. And I've given some examples, caramel, toffee, nutty, which are strong on the palate and persistent on the long evolving finish. So it's not just saying that the finish itself is long, it's that the flavors themselves are actually developing on that finish. So I think with this one, you're actually tasting just as much once you've spat the wine out as when it was in your, your mouth. So really simply, I've just put all these elements contribute to the outstanding quality of the wine. You could phrase it in a different way and to state um, why it's better than very good. You know, that would really cement it into the outstanding quality. But I think I've really pushed this wine up as much as it, as it can be. So we call it outstanding. Okay, so again, going back to our um, pale cream sherry, and once we've smelt our Oloroso, when you go back to it on the nose, you can actually see how simple it is on the nose. So actually what I may then do is to write back on my nose, I think it's simple. Um, so onto the palate. So the wine is sweet. Um, not as sweet as um, Sauternes or a Tokai, but it's still within that sweet category. 
Um, and again, the acidity level is towards the lower end of, um, um, of the scale. Medium alcohol this time. But what's really interesting comparing it to the Oloroso is I feel the alcohol is burning a little bit on, on the palate. So even though there's less alcohol, it's actually holding itself um, not as well. Um, when you're looking at the intensity of the flavor on the palate, it would be really easy to actually say this has got lots of flavor. But actually what it's got is a lot of sugar. So if you imagine taking all of that sugar out of this wine, there would be very little flavor. So this is actually light intensity of flavor. A little bit of bread dough, yeast. It reminds me a little bit of um, um, the bread buns with the icing sugar on the top. So it's kind of as simple as you can get. Um, the finish as well, if you were to take away the sugar, you wouldn't really be tasting any flavor. And sugar isn't part of finish. Acidity is not part of finish. It always has to be the, the positive flavors. So in terms of quality, um, we're actually going to call this one acceptable. So this is going to be a different way of writing it because what we're doing is we're saying um, there are some negatives to this wine rather than positives. But we're still saying it's an acceptable wine. There's an acceptable balance between the medium alcohol and the flavor intensity but the wine does seem slightly burning on the palate and the sweetness creates a cloying sensation. So it's always important when you're um, noting something about balance to say, what does it do to the wine? Is it a positive balance or a negative balance? Um, I said the wine lacks the flavor intensity and precision of aromas of a good wine and its short and simple finish is further evidence of its acceptable quality. So that's just a way of saying if it was a good um, wine, it would need to have a little bit more flavor, a bit more precision. You could have added complexity into this as well, perhaps as well. Yeah, again, super interesting. And, you know, indeed, having been down to Hareth myself earlier this year, it's just it's a really it's a category that I now hold you know, quite dearly. And it's interesting to 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 take this deeper dive there. I've, again, I've written down a. A number of different things and I think there's a couple of things that are, uh, really jump out at me and the one I've sort of put the big star next to is is sugar um, because I was I was fooled by the Oloroso I, I, I took it in I had that sensation in my mouth afterwards that I jumped straight to uh, straight to sugar on that and, and you know actually at the same time as you were saying it's completely dry, so I was I was obviously there with a with a sort of a furrowed brow, and um, I just wonder if you wouldn't mind just expanding a bit on that point that you made around, I guess telling the difference between that that oloroso we've just had, which doesn't have any sugar in, but might sort of give that impression, mm. versus then I guess moving to the to the cream, it's then a lot more obvious as a sensation but i wonder if you wouldn't mind just you put you know expanding on that putting that a bit more into words that somebody might be able to sort of have front of mind when they're going into that fortified exam okay so one of the the common points um is to try and work out whether a wine is has sugar or doesn't have sugar at a higher alcohol level and with aromas that you always associate with sweetness anyway, honey or caramel or toffee, your brain naturally will almost over-sweeten what, um, what the wine actually is. So um, just to be aware that it's difficult is actually one of the most powerful things. So um, you have to work out within the exam how you work out whether it is sweet or whether it's not. And actually one of the best things is if you do have a wine that you're absolutely convinced is sweet then if you try your wine that you weren't sure whether it was dry or sweet afterwards if it was sweet then the wine wouldn't change itself but actually if we have a sip of our um, um, pale cream which we know is sweet and we're confident so we do that in the exam we now go and try our oloroso Can you see now that there's a much stronger sharpness to it? And actually a lot of the flavours that we were getting in the Oloroso um, have now dampened down and it feels a little bit astringent. 
So that's how you can, within that exam, calibrate yourself mm. to that. Um, but it's the age old thing, practice, practice, practice. And this is why, you know, also it's great recording these two episodes side by side because I can then kind of make the connection back to the first episode. And then in terms of those questions that you were sort of saying, you know, we should have in our mind as we go into the exam, you know, am I smelling lemon? Am I smelling toast? Um, yeah, could you just sort of say something about what those questions might be or how they might change going now into a fortified exam? Okay, so when you are looking at the wines in front of you in a, uh, a blind fortified exam, again, be it a diploma or a master of wine, it wouldn't matter uh, which one you're looking at. You actually have to look at how many wines there are, either in your syllabus or out there. And um, quite frankly, if you see a pale lemon fortified wine coming towards you, it's either going to be some sort of fino or potentially some sort of white port or maybe it would be a fortified muscat. So you're kind of choosing between three things. So if if that comes towards you, you should have actually prepared for those things to, or for those particular wines to, to be there. So first of all, I would take a sniff and I would say, do I smell any bread or yeasty character? If the answer is yes, it's only going to be a fino style. The answer is no, then you go, well, is it going to be a muscat or is it going to be a white port? And then if you have a little look um, into the wine um, and it ends up smelling quite strongly of grape, tropical fruit, peach, apricot that you get with muscat, then there you are. You've got it. So it's actually just putting all the wines that you may expect to come up in a really small um, sort of tight syllabus and to say, could I work out? the difference between them um, outside of the exam, just on paper. And as long as you've got your thought process of why they're different, then actually when it comes across in the exam, then it's an easier, easier place to be. And again, in, in a kind of compare and contrast, I've written down here visual. So it sounds as though actually in the fortified exam, you've actually got quite a lot of visual clues mm. that, that are going to help you and, and actually can help you rather than tripping you up which you may not have in in the other styles of exam that's my read of that so the visual clues with um fortified wines um are a lot stronger than the other um the other exams that you may do and quite frankly if it's got some sort of brown tinge to it you have to say well where does that come from and it's only oxidation so if you you see it as the wines are being poured out that you're going to be assessing a, a brownish uh sample then it's pretty sure that you might be smelling something oxidized as well. So, you know, your brain needs to be ticking along for your caramel, your toffee, um, anything on the sort of the, the nutty scale as well. So it can really, really help. Um, particularly your red fortified wines. There aren't that many fortified wines that are made with red grapes other than port or maybe some Southern French Van du Naturel. Um, so again, your head should be pushing more towards that category. And it's not that you really want to always be looking at the wines and then automatically guessing what they are, but it's actually just a technique that can help you. It's logic, really. And then, yeah, really, I'm curious about that point that you made here around quality and, and saying, OK, what, what is the, the wine sort of trying to do? And potentially because um, I've always come across these styles of wine, fortified wine, generally in the context of food, you know, I mean, and I know that's in the case of sherry, for example, that's something that they, they've been very um, active on and, and talking about that. I just wonder, is, is that sort of too much information really to, to bring into an exam? If you're talking about assessing a wine, I mean, is it okay to, to even talk about the food or the pairing or, or, or are we kind of in a, in a, in a sense talking about this archetypal pheno that kind of exists by itself on a, on a, a plateau somewhere? So in short, to answer the question, there are no marks allocated for anything to do with food and wine pairing um, in, within the tasting part of the examination. That said, I think it's really important when you're trying to understand the category to actually understand the way that it is presented in, in the real world. 
Um, and also if you're thinking about um, the way that wines are marketed, uh, the way, way that they're sold for the theory part of the examination, then it's really important to to have that on your radar. But in terms of the tasting, it's very simple. It's just about what the wine tastes like in the glass. So that was just a few um, a few tips and, and really getting in, inside my head about the thought process of how you assess fortified wines. Um, and that's really what we wanted to create on our um, individual tasting days that get people ready for their um, Diploma and Master of Wine exams. Um, so we really go head to toe with as many wines as possible. Um, so we look at 15, um, 15 wines in the day. And the beauty of it is that you really get to compare the wines side by side. Um, you get to look at the difference between acidity in a Madeira compared to sherries. Um, you get to have a look at the different types of muscats that, we, um, that exist within, within the syllabus. Um, and really importantly, you get to have feedback so we like to um, train our students in the morning, keep them going throughout the entire day, um, work out what they're struggling with, um, correct them, and then they prove it at the end. And then we give them further feedback. So we really like to see it as a full circle um, tasting day to give people as much confidence um, as possible for their exams. It's super fun as well. Thank you so much, Jim. Another fantastic episode that I'm sure will help a lot of people who are preparing for exams next year. Do be sure to check out the website and social media handles below for the Global Wine Academy. And if you're out there listening and you found this useful, I'd love for you to let me know. You can find me on social media where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter and email hello at interpretingwine.com. See you next time.